Uh, I work at Biosphere Institute of the Bow Valley, and uh, I'm organizing our Earth Talks. That's the other side of the bird kind. Um, Earth Talks is a place for us to have conversations about uh, the environment and about issues that are important to us. Uh, so definitely invite you to ask questions at any point. Um, we've got a smaller group tonight, that's fun. Um, we'll just have a nice intimate discussion with a few people online. So you might hear me put my hand up and say, hey, there's someone online who's got a question at some point. Um, but yeah, that's um, the purpose of this evening. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are meeting today on Treaty 7 territory in uh, Chachachuan, Kudemi, uh, in Canmore. And uh, the traditional lands of the Sony Dakota nations of Bears, Paul, Chiniki, and Houston. Uh, and Treaty 7 territory is also uh, signed by the, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Supana Nation, Metis Nation of Alberta, we can And of course, it includes everybody else who lives, works, and plays here. Um, I think for me, this, uh, this treaty is this agreement and a promise to. Uh, support the land, to support each other, and to live together in the best way that we can. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, it's always something good to have in the backs of our minds. And I think it does relate a little bit to our topic tonight, which is all about family hiking and how to be safe and how to have fun on our trails, um, how to be respectful as well. Uh, so that's a big part of it. And uh, we've got Two fantastic speakers. We've got Nick De Reuter from the Wild Smart Program at the Biosphere Institute, and uh, Linda Pianotti, who's a local author, a Four Seasons uh, hiking guide, um, and author of Take a Hike with Your Children. We've got the book up in front here if you want to have a look. Um, and also has uh, three mountain family hikes as for this. So uh, I'll give it over to you two and take it away. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank thanks, Erica. Linda, Linda's going to start us off tonight. So go ahead, Linda. Thank you. Welcome. It's uh, quite easy now. I'm sure you'd rather be on biking or maybe even going for a hike around the river at the moment. <laughs> I'm going to start with um, there's this mentality called day hiking mentality. I'm so close to the trailhead or I'm so close to town. Why would I need to take a headlamp? Why would I need to have extra food or extra clothing? What could possibly go wrong? Anybody got an idea of what could go wrong? A biker runs into A biker runs into <laughs> yes. You step over a log and you think you've broken your ankle, but it just turns out to be a very bad sprain. This happened um, 2012, I think it was. But while I was going to become a hiking guide, I wasn't using hiking poles. We were in the civil flats area. There was no cell phone coverage. I did not have an injury to the knee or a spot. I was with my youngest son at the time, who I believe was seven, and my husband. And um, we had to, I had to limp out, crawl on my hands and knees at times. And when we got to the stairs that we came down where the car was, I actually scooted up on my bum off the stairs. My husband dropped me off at the Cochrane, um, it wasn't a hospital, but at the Cochrane Medical Center there. And the doctor, I'm, I'm in the, the emerge, I'm in the triage room. The doctor pulls the screen back and says, You better hope that's broken. Mm -hmm. Because he said, If that's the sprain, I think it is. And he's correct. I have not been able to put my ankle into that particular ankle into downhill speed with comfort since then. So, preface this hike or preface this talk with the fact that I thought I was, I was very close to the trailhead, close to Calgary. There's got to be self coverage. Just going for an hour and a half at the most, what could go wrong? So after that, I quickly realized that I'm going to go for my um, guiding, full on guiding certificate. And I now carry and pack a very um, extensive day hike checklist. Now, who of you have heard about the 10 essentials for hiking? Andrew, can you want to tell me that what you think those are? Uh, it's just like things that you should always have with you when you're outside um, in case something happens, they're probably going to help you out. Exactly. And so if I will just look at the, now I press here, right? Oh, we can see it. So hiking gear, the first line, hiking gear. I had my backpack, I had my shoes, you know, I didn't have poles at the time and I wasn't carrying a child at the time. I did not have my communication device that worked. I had a cell phone. Everything you see in this list that's in red are one of the 10 essentials. I didn't have emergency shelter. Thankful it was a beautiful sunny day. It wasn't raining. I was fine. 
Food and water. Yeah, I had food and water. Um, did I have an extra supply? Absolutely not. I did not have an extra supply. I did not have any extra water. I was wearing the clothing that I was wearing for that day because I was out hiking, but I didn't have extra clothing. I didn't have sun protection. Well, I had sun protection. Didn't have anything for fire sources. First aid kit wasn't extensive enough. I had some bandages and that was it. Like I'm talking like the kind to slap on a stab or something or a scar. Had some bug repellent, um, no headlamp, no multi-purpose tool. Had some hygiene, personal hygiene items there. Um, no emergency plan. One can of bear spray that my husband was carrying. And at one point in time, I said, I'm just going to sit here. You go back and bring the car as close as you can because we were on a um, access road for oil and gas. We could see that there was a, a gate down there, and I'm sure you could have brought it over. Um, but then as I'm sitting there, leaning up against the tree in pain, I see what I think are wolves. They could have been coyotes. I know they weren't dogs because <laughs> I didn't see anybody else coming behind these domesticated dogs running across and I screamed at them. I said, don't leave me, I'm coming out with that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I made every mistake because I um, because I didn't have these red um, dogs. So we'll go on hiking here. Um, backpack, 20, 30 meter for a day. Now this is my backpack. I carry a larger one all the time because when I died, I have a lot of extra stuff in there. Fit and comfort is the most important for a backpack. It might fit you, but it may not fit your husband. It may not fit one of your children. So I would say there are two items that I would always spend my money on, um, and that is a backpack and a pair of good shoes or hiking boots. And this is my son at Lake O'Hara. Does anybody camp at Lake O'Hara taking the bus up? Yeah, so um, that backpack fits him, but what's in there is just way too much, it's too heavy. But this is the bus up to the campground and then a short walk to the, um, the uh, campsites. And he is actually happy to be there. He doesn't look like he is. Other hiking gear. Um, <laughs> Snoopy yeah. boots. No, which one of these pictures doesn't belong? The first yeah. one. Yeah. This goes back to that day hiker mentality I'm chatting about. That first photo I took on Tunnel Mountain in Banff National Park. The number of people I've seen go up that trail in footwear like this, and not just adults, but little kids. And I see stub toes and everything. So even a decent pair of running shoes. And if you've got children that are in school, they probably asked you to uh, send a child to school with their non-marking non shoes. Those are extremely slippery. You want a pair of shoes that's got a really good tread. And you don't have to have the top of the line hiking boots or hiking gear. Uh, my boys are 19 months apart, so I could hand shoes down every now and then. It worked well. Uh, families with infants and toddlers, child carriers. As I mentioned, my boys are 19, apart, 19 months apart. Um, I love my chariot. I could pack them in that. I could take them on many trails. If the weather turned, I could get them all cozy. This picture to the uh, right here, um, that's uh, about four months old, the little guy in the front. And remember one behind me was going to be turning down two in about three weeks. So we took the gondola up. We didn't um, walk up or anything. We just weren't into that. But that's um, the carriers. Make sure that your child carrier is suitable for what you're going to do for the day and it's comfortable for the person that's carrying it. And you'll see that the little guy in front, um, he's finally able to turn facing forward. His neck is strong enough. And my other one in the back there was in and out, bouncing up and down, feeling my husband's back. So if you're going to buy a backpack for yourself, these are the things that, well, I hope you get one for yourself in Europe. These are the things you want to look at. This is how you measure. So backpack is not measured on your total height, but it's measured on this part that you can see on the um, little diagram. Really important to go somewhere where they can fit you. Now, not all companies are universal with their fittings. So you may be, I'm going to just say, um, you know, 30 inches in that spot there. And in one brand, you could be a small medium. In another brand, you could be a medium. So you have to be fit for that. Once you know what proper fit is, you can start looking for secondhand gear, which there's lots of, and then try to get yourself into a secondhand bag if you can. Child backpack carrier. If you're just carrying your little ones, you know, you've got the hip belt, all the weight from a backpack and a child carrier will sit on your hips. Um, you've got the chest strap, the sternum strap that goes across. It's pretty much the same straps that you have on a regular pack. 
Then in addition, you've got either rain and sunhood, sunhood little ones, comfort foot loops, not perch loops. Uh, a ventilated back panel for yourself because you get hot and sweaty. You really do when you're carrying some extra weight on your back. Um, yeah, and then uh, the storage pockets. If you can find a backpack that has a lot of storage pockets, that's fantastic. The pack that we had in the first photo when we started hiking didn't have a great storage packet at all, uh, but they've gotten much better over the years. Hiking poles are recommended. And it's not just for playing games on the trail. Um, go back to my ankle. Had I been using hiking poles, I would have put the hiking poles on the other side of that log to step over. I probably could have used the hiking poles to possibly splint my ankle to maybe get out. I would have had a hiking pole to lean on a bit rather than my kids and my son. And just I'll touch briefly with um, animal safety there, Wild Smart. Um, you can make yourself look bigger when you put some hiking poles over your head, right? So they're important. And um, they act as a third leg. They give you that extra balance in case some stress off your knees and your hips when you're hiking. All right, we've got two um, of the 10 essentials, the communication and signaling device and navigation. As I said, not all trails have cell phones. I mean, you drive up Spray Lakes Road, you get the haul in, there is no cell coverage. And they, that you can see, you can spit on my house from Holland, to be honest with you. That's how close we are to town. So make sure you have something, an in-reach. They've got spots. There's new ones out. There's one called the Zolio. They keep coming out with these new devices all the time. I recently heard that you can use some of the new iPhones. I haven't heard how they are, how they're working. I don't know. That whistle there is a keyless whistle. And I say keyless because you get the whistles that have keys in them, the little um, cork keys in there. They get cold, they freeze, they get wet, they don't work. So get a whistle that's keyless. And navigation, of course, get a really good hiking book. Get um, You can download all the PDFs uh, from the different parks, Bam, Creek, and Yoho. And when you get to the trailhead, if they've got a sign there with a map on it, take a photo of that map, and it's on your phone. And you don't have to worry about having a Wi-Fi connection you don't get your photo, right? Emergency shelter, that's another one of the uh, 10 essentials. Um, you can just read what it says there yourself right now. I'll take a look at it. That is not a real emergency. That's my husband. I just wanted to put up the shelter so that we could show people what um what it would look like so what this is this what's in this bag is that yellow tarp that's between the two trees quite large i can get um three or four people under that so we can stay dry he's in this little sleeping bag which i carry in the pack and um on the top photos there we've got um the blue tarp is another larger tarp and then this is a lot. I carry this because I'm guiding and I have to have all this extra stuff. But the little um, Mylar emergency blanket, the one time use blanket, is sufficient as well for somebody. But I just wanted to point out that you should have some kind of shelter when you're out there just in case something happens. Food and water for the day. Always pack enough for yourself for the day and for the people that you're bringing with you. Um, that just got some ideas, you know, what you can take there. And I always say, start with a really high protein breakfast. Some people don't have breakfast. You try to have your breakfast on the day you head out hiking. And then always pack extra food. Um, you never know what could happen. What's going to land you on that trail a little longer? It could have been an emergency like I had. It could be um, the weather turns suddenly all of a sudden. It's not unusual, particularly in the middle of the summer when we get these flash thunderstorms that can come in. And if you're up high on something and you can start to see the big clouds starting to get to gather, get down low as soon as you can because you could have a thunderstorm and then you may have to ride that out somewhere. So you want to have some extra food when you're on that. Or um, I've had individuals that are diabetic that have come up for a day with me and they've gotten stuck in traffic on the way back to Calgary and they haven't had enough food in their car. You know, they pack just what they need to pack and off they off they go and then I think I don't need any more. Water. Um I work with middle school students and the other day we took a group up to Yamusta 
And the one little guy had his water bottle about this size done about a quarter of the way in. And he was begging his friends, can I have a sip? Can I have a sip? Take plenty of little sips throughout the day. Fill up your tank before you start hiking. That's important to you, little ones. And the bottom point there, keep an eye on young children and adults over the age of 65. They don't have that thirst mechanism. They're, by the time you're thirsty, it's too late. If you've got to kill the tongue, your tongue off the roof of your mouth, it's too late. You've got to, you need to start drinking some more water. And have maybe a salty snack because that'll help absorb the water as well. So extra water, a way to purify it. Um, there you go. I'll pass it around later. But this is my scary pen. Um, it is an ultraviolet pen. It's supposed to remove 99.9% .9 of whatever is in there. We've used it plenty of times. Um, we always, when the kids were younger, we always made sure we picked a hike that had a water source. And this was one of their jobs as they got older. <laughs> it was one of their jobs to make sure we were drinking enough and make sure that we were replenishing our water. Sometimes it tasted a little fruity. I'll admit that, but at least we had water and it was safe water. We knew we were going to get sick. Seasonally appropriate clothing. Well, when you're heading out for the day, you're going to put some clothing on that's seasonally appropriate. Mind you, I'm sure you've all seen a few people on the trail and you think, hmm, what were they thinking? But I, these are my boys at Lake O'Hara, lovely family camping area. You can get into it now. And I really like one of my oldest two standing up. He's wearing a pair of short pants. You can zip off into shorts. My youngest has got his shorts zipped off. They both have their hats on. And the shirts they're wearing are not um, the expensive shirts with the uh, SPF factor in them. They're just a really tight weave shirt that will block some of the rays. And they were starting to be the teenage. We could start to smell them a bit on the trail there. So it would wick away in the sweat as well, <coughs> which helped. <laughs> Extra clothing. I always have extra clothing. We call it a dry bag. This is my little dry bag here. Um, and in that bag, I have, depending on the season, I will have changed some of the stuff out. But the top row that you see on this screen is what I always have in the dry bag. Wool blend socks, um, wool ball johns, wool long shirt, and a wool hat of some kind. And that's because my Youngest son, for example, we were at Lake O'Hara, we were crossing a bridge, and he fell in to the glacial water. And just a blood curdling scream that came out of him, soaking wet. And I had to get him out of his wet clothes, on top of all of his wet clothes. And I put him into what is in my dry bag. And it was just one of those, another beautiful, sunny, warm day. He was wearing those light pants that you saw in the previous um, picture, and it dried out quite nicely. And so that helped. Um, the little, um, I don't know if this is, you see that? No, keep the lights working. But the far right, um, picture there is this deer right here, all folded into my hood. So that's my raincoat, my rain pants. And inside, I will keep this in my backpack now until, uh, the start of, um, winter pretty much. Because these are warm enough that if I'm out and I get a bit of a, the important thing is, is you want to stay warm and dry. You want to keep the wind off you and the wetness off you. So I can um, put these on and I can keep that on as well. And then in my pocket here, I've always got a backup of just some light um, wool gloves. And I've got my buff as well for a headgear or a neck gear to help out with that. All right, so extra clothing. Sun protection. We always go out. You know, again, here I am with a tight weave, um, long sleeve shirt. It's not an SPF by any means. I didn't spend the money on it. I've got my hat, I've got my big glasses, and I wear the glasses that come around so that the sun doesn't come in the side of my face. Those pants um, apparently had an SPF, the shorts have an SPF factor in them. I've got my hiking poles. Does anybody recognize this particular trail? Mm -hmm. No, it's um, Mount Edith Bell in Jasper. And about the only thing I can get into now these days is that hat. <laughs> Everything else has been given away. <laughs> fire sources, three fire sources. All right, so waterproof matches lighter and flint. Um, not all lighters will work at certain elevations and normally work when it gets really cold. Not all matches are waterproof, trust me. 
And that flint, you yeah, better practice doing that at home because it's not as easy as it looks on those survival, um, the survival courses. So you've got three sources of fire that can get something going. Um, the bottom two photos are just a practice. I practice in the winter time because we don't want to start a fire right now in the, in the snow valley. Um, so on the snow, that's a little bit of cotton, a cotton ball. And then I've squeezed some of my hand sanitizer on it. Uh, I've got just some little tiny pieces of um, twigs that I found on the ground. And I lit the flint and then it kept going. And we just slowly have to build the fire up. Uh, the little, um, uh, what do you call it, tea light candle. That actually, if you like that, and put it underneath some brush, it can actually help get uh, fire going as well. And then those, I got Santa put those in my stocking, um, the squares, and they have a real chemical smell to them. I'm not sure where um, my husband got them for me, but they do light really well. It's just that there's a really a smell to them. So I can't, I don't like it in my backpack. So yes, fire, two sources of fire. First aid kits. Um, always a small, quick access pouch. And I keep that in the top of my backpack here. And this is ideal for, you know, this is where it goes in here. It's ideal for when little minor alleys, you know, and maybe little fake minor alleys, but anything to keep them active and going and, and you know, interested in hanging on and, and continuing the hike. So that's in there. And then I have my main first aid kit with all of my gear, it's still in my pack. And then this is my main first aid kit where I've got most of all my other gear. I've got a, a sand splint in there, which I could have really used that time I sprained my ankle. So there's a splint there. You can splint it for an arm and ankle. Um, it's wrapped up in there. Duct tape, don't leave home without it. This duct tape, oh my gosh, you can use it for so many things. Uh, you, you cut your jacket and the gown starts falling out. Put some duct tape on it. My husband was getting a hot spot on his heel one time. We put that on his heel because the band-aid wasn't sticking just the way that his boot was rubbing on it. I've got my um, first aid for my milk guard in there if I haven't had to do CPR. So that's all in my bigger kit. And can't stress this enough. Um, particularly if you're hiking with families and younger children or just anybody, one person, at least one person should have taken a basic wilderness first aid course, hopefully two. Because what happens if you're the one that gets injured and you're unconscious and the other person doesn't know what's going on? So at least one, two, hopefully in your, in your group. A lot of talk about uh, ticks lately and bug spray. Person, does anybody have tick on them around here on camera? Oh, yeah, not around here, but I've heard a tick on me. I did it in bed. Did you have to pull it? Yes, I did it in bed. My scalp. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. Yep. And I heard two tick stories today. I was at the hair salon this morning, and a guy had just left his chair because the hair stylist found a tick. Oh. And he went home, and um, the wife removed it, and then he came back. Wow. And the two stylists said, there was definitely blood there. And he said, oh, no, it hadn't even grown yet. And they were like, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. it, okay. Yeah. And then a woman who was up to me and said she figured she picked one up walking just with her groceries. She set the bag down. So she ended up with a tip on her shoulder and it burrowed in and she's on antibiotics. Right Interesting. Now. Okay. So, now, so does start. The ticks here have any? Yes. South of Ontario. So the water ticks have a lot of stuff. Yeah. They're starting. So okay. keep the ticks. These are the tick hop spots that we have um, that you got to check. If you look out for the little ones there lying on the ground, checking stuff out, just this is the area that you want to check. And if you have animals, if you take any dogs for a walk, you can bring them back home and check them as well. Um, headlamp, definitely have to have one of those. And I'm not if you have a flashlight, that's okay. But we say headlamps because then your hands are free. Right? So you have to have your hands free, particularly if you're little ones, because you want to keep them within arm's reach. Or have a bed if at night if there's a big something or other on the trail you want to be able to pull out your your flat your uh, bear spray. Multi-purpose tool and repair kit always have those with you as well. It doesn't have to be really expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive one. That's a Leatherman. I'll pass that around later. I'm all about recycling and upcycling. So that's my repair kit. I've got twist ties, more duct tape, bobby pins or uh, safety pins. And a pair of old skate laces that aren't being used anymore. And that is an old sunglass case um, that I pack it all into and keep it in there. Um, toiletries and hygiene products, of course, you always have to have those with you. Emergency plans, a trip plan. 
always leave something with somebody, tell somebody where you're going. And adventuresmart.ca is a great organization of BC, and they've got online trip plans that you can pull out. And they ask questions like, what trailhead? What's your first trailhead? Your second trailhead? How many in the party? What, what car are you driving? What's your license? Like, when are you expected to return? When should the people that are expecting you initiate a phone call to somebody to say they're not back yet? And if you finish the trail and think, oh, I'm going to go for dinner in Banff, please call these people and tell them that you're having dinner in Banff so they don't initiate the phone call. Um, an on-trail emergency plan. We'll go back to when I sprained my ankle. There's a real trend lately for um, people to be going out on their own with both their kids. As long as you're really, I, okay, you're going to Lake Minnewanka, tons of people there, that's great. You're going to Johnson Lake, tons of people there. But if you're going on your own, two little ones, a little one on the back, a little one on the front, and you hurt yourself, who's going to help? How is this emergency plan going to take place? The little ones aren't going to help you. So you're going to have to have a discussion. You should go with somebody anyway on these trips. You should always have a second adult with you or go to a party. It's always better when there's more. But if you get injured and your little one is there with you, practice with them at home what they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to wander off. They're supposed to tuck up right beside you. Same thing with you if you're out there with a the group and something happens. What's the emergency plan that you should be doing if somebody gets injured? And what to do if you get lost? It's common knowledge you stop, stay in one place, turn around, look for other people, turn around and see if you can um, uh, see the other trail, uh, other people on the trail, um, stop walking, stop talking, and uh, prepare to be there and just hunt her down. You've got your shelter, you've got some extra food, you've got fire, you can be, you're going to be okay until somebody finds you. And if you're by yourself, and you have an in reach, maybe hit the SOS. Bear spray, always have it. I think we'll go over that later. All right, so you've got all the equipment that you need to take. How do you pick the right trail for your own hiking ability or the family that you're out with? We're gonna start on this mountain and we're gonna work our way up the mountain. Number one, you have to be really honest. What are the hiking abilities of everybody in your group? Be honest, you said you're from Ontario. My parents are from Ontario. They come out and the um, elevation kills them. It's, it's, you got to really be honest as to what your abilities are. What are the age and stages of your group members? Like, are you some walking, some riding, or some running, or some crawling? You got to really think about that before you think the trail. How much time do you have for a hike? If, you know, I just finished work at four o'clock. I think I could probably go for the next two hours. Okay, great depending on the ages and stages and the abilities of your other group. If you're going to go for a higher elevation, just remember it takes a lot longer to get up these elevations. Um, some of them, uh, maybe not so much, depending on the elevation, the steepness of it. Hiking pace and distance covered, you know, you don't really want to um, run on these trails. You want to take it easy and enjoy time of year. If it's the early fall, late spring, what are the terrain conditions like? You know, in the early morning, it's a little icy. Then it starts to get a little muddy as the day warms up. Time of day, are you going out at night? I, as a hiking guide, never take groups out at night because I think the animals need the night, the trails at night, not me. Um, so time of day, I try to go early in the morning, particularly in the winter time. So I'm finishing my trail in daylight. And logistics, some hikes are one way only. Or not, sorry, not one way only, but uh, I'm thinking of um, Yoho Pass in Yoho National Park. You don't want to go up and down that in one day. So you may want to have somebody drop you off on one side and pick you up on the other side. So those are logistics. Who's driving? Who's parking? There's a couple hikes in Kananaskis that are like that as well. What are the best practices to keep your group together on the trail? Once you've picked your hike, younger children are always within arm's reach. So you can touch them and pull close for a whole host of reasons. Wildlife being one, um, if you're getting too close, maybe the edge of a cliff that you're not aware of, you're coming up to a water hazard. Um, set the pace for the slowest group member. You always hike at the pace of the slowest group member. At all the trail junctions, do a head count. You start at the six, 
Are there six of you at the trail at the trail junction? Be aware of your surroundings. That's the wild smart stuff that we're talking about. Stay together. One person decides they don't want to continue. Stop. See why. Maybe they just need a break. Maybe they need to be dehydrated. Maybe they're just not feeling well. Maybe they just don't want to finish. We all turn around and go back. We don't let somebody go back. Unless you're from here to the trailhead away and you can see the car and that's where they're going to go and sit for the day. And then, of course, we can read all the trailhead signs. You, um, if it says trail closed, bear an area. Don't mock to take that photo of the bear in the area. Nick will thank you for that. <laughs> How much further? <laughs> You're going to get that question. Not just from adults, or not just from children, but from adults. So this is my youngest. How much further? Um, there's games, there's nature's apps, there's nature identification books. These are great for packing with little kids. They're so light. They fold up. This one is specifically for Banff National Park. Um, and, you know, they may or may not see the animals, but it gives them something to look at. It gives them something to put into their own little pack because they like to feel like they're doing something as well, right? Um, Merlin Bird, I was just talking about a great app on um, the phone here. Um, there's iNaturalist, Seek by iNaturalist, which is you don't need to have an account for. And uh, sing songs, bring friends. Just anything to keep the kids interested and people that you're with interested as well. Dual purpose hikes. I really liked this when the kids were at, when they were no longer in the um, the child carrying stages. So the, the hike on the left here is Boom Lake. We hiked up with all the fishing rods for the day. My husband and son fished for the day. The hike on the right is in the yeah, Hot Springs. This was after Sulphur Mountain. It's reward for everybody. Um, a good job, well done. Not all these mountains. This is Dinosaur Provincial National. Yeah, Dinosaur Provincial Park. Gorgeous park. Hoodoo is just amazing. My boys love it. I want to get back there. And special snacks. I always threw some special snacks in for the boys. My oldest here used to love making trail or uh, trail snacks for us. We would, as a treat, we would get the uh, dehydrated stuff and he would bake it. And then my youngest there would love gummy worms and he still loves the gummy worms. My parting words are live in the moment. Your children grow up. You grow older and might not be able to keep up. That's the two of them saying, see you later, mom at the bottle, pass them out. And for heaven's sakes, don't compare yourself to anyone on social media. <laughs> Just do what you need to do to enjoy your day on the trail. Here's some important contact numbers for you before you head out. Um, I can bring that up later because I know Nick, I've cut into you. Okay, okay. yeah. So I can give this to you later as well. Did you want to talk to me first now? Or was a question? I know, I'd say, I was going to say, if you've got some good burning questions, feel free to ask okay. them now before you forget them. Okay. In, in your backpack, I, I didn't see anything for pills, possibly aspirin or oh, I, a bee sting. Uh... I've got it. It's all in here. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. it's all in here. Yes, I carry um, all of that Benadryl yeah. and aspirin. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Leo. There you go. Remember this email address and the Facebook page and Instagram account. All right. All right. Thanks, Lalinda. So I'm going to talk about the wildlife side of things. So, you know, we're all prepared. We're choosing the right height, we're doing all those things. Now there's wildlife out there. So what can we do to avoid those encounters? And ideally, if we do these things, we never have to pull out our bear spray. We never have to, you know, do the stop talk of what I'm going to talk about. I teach how to use bear spray, and I have actually never had to use bear spray on any animals. It could be the fact that I make a lot of noise. It could be the fact that my children make a lot of noise. And I choose wisely. I don't go into closed areas, and I... And, and I normally do my research before I go into those like so. Uh, but that being said, as you'll see later, you can do everything right, and you might still run into a bear or other wildlife, so you need to be prepared to handle those encounters. So, easiest thing right off the bat, make noise. I like to say, hey, oh, some people say, yo, bear, which is fine, it's noise, but for me, it's confusing because if I hear someone say, yo, bear, I think there's a bear. Because if I saw a bear, I'd say, hey, a bear. So, any kind of noise is good. It doesn't matter what you say, just loud noise. Now, when I'm talking, we've been going out for a two hour hike. 
I don't mean for two hours straight that you say, hail, 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 hail. I'm talking if you've got a wide open straight trail, you can see lots of sight lines, you don't need to be making noise the whole time. But anytime you're going over a hill, you know, blind crest of the hill, around the corner, think of education. And sometimes you'll get in spots where you're like, if I was a bear, this is where I would hang out. You get that tingling feeling, then there's probably a bear. And chances are you might see a bear there. So that make some extra noise in those spots. The human voice is the best tool to make that noise. Travel in groups. Um, you know, we were talking, or we're talking about you know, traveling groups and how much safer it is. Ideally, four or more. Uh, that doesn't mean you'll never get into an encounter with any wildlife, but they did research in North America over 100 years, all the black bear attacks, and over 92% were people that were by themselves with a big two. So the bigger your group, the safer you're going to be. You've ever noticed those seasonal travel restrictions in places like Lake Minnewanka, other places in Banff National Park? One of those restrictions is you have to have four or more people. They didn't just randomly choose that number out of a hat. It's based on the research, it is much safer the bigger your group is. And you automatically make more noise and you're more intimidating to the wildlife. And you really want to keep those children close by. Being aware of your surroundings is key. Look and listen for signs of wildlife. This time of year, there's still a fair bit of mud. Well, not with this kind of weather, it's going to dry up quickly, but you know, up higher, there might still be snow on the ground, mud, look for signs, look for scat. Um, if you see a fresh steaming pile of scat on the trail, there's a bear in the area. Uh, and I've got a couple of pictures of some scat after this. And if there is that fresh scat, you know, either turn around or make extra noise. Pull your bear spray out. Be ready. Almost everyone I've talked to that's been in a bear a close encounter or a bear attack, when they think back to like, okay, what were the events leading up? What could I have done differently? Almost all of them say there were signs. And I didn't take them seriously, or I just forgot. You know, I saw that fresh pile of scat, I saw the steam still coming up, and I didn't get my bear spray out, or I wasn't making noise. So, really, um, be aware of your surroundings. That's the best thing I can say. Just look and listen for sign. Mm -hmm. Don't wear earbuds. I see a lot of people, you know, trail running, mountain biking, hiking with earbuds in. You can't hear your children or other people's children, or other people might be asking for help. Help, help. You can't hear them. And most of the animals here are pretty tolerant of us, and they give us lots of warning signals and sounds if we're too close. Bears might do a, you know, a jaw popping or like a roar or a woof. You know, elk might be stomping their feet. All these things make noise. If you're wearing earbuds, you can't hear those warning signs. Keeping dogs on a leash is a key one. You know, there are off-leash dog parks in Canmore and Banff and those places, but typically most of the places, for sure in the national park, but in provincial parks and all those places. You have to have your dogs on a leash, but it's safer for you, for your dog, for other people, and the wildlife if they're on a leash. If you can't handle them on a leash, then consider leaving them at home. If you're going with, you know, a few families and a whole bunch of kids and a whole bunch of dogs, and you don't think you can handle man managing kids, holding dogs on a leash, using your bear spray in case of an emergency, it kind of comes to that planning ahead. Like, how are you going to actually handle an emergency? If you don't think you can handle all those things, then take some pieces out of the equation. Uh, maybe leave your dog at home. And and then you don't have to worry about that dog being on a leash. Because you have no unless you've seen what your dog does with a bear nearby, you don't know how they're gonna react. And so if you've also got your kids and your dog, it might be a little bit too much for you to handle and still trying to get your bear spray out. Never run away from wildlife. You know, I teach it to the kids that from an early age in the school and uh and, and, and I think they get it. And you know, I always tell them, tell your parents, remind your parents, never run away from wildlife. Um, it's a, a, a good story, it's a sad story, but the best one to illustrate that, and the reason why we don't run is because these, these animals, these predators, they have a chase instinct. If an animal runs away, they think it's prey and they'll chase after it. A few years ago in Washington state, there were two gentlemen mountain biking. They came across a cougar and the cougar attacked one of the, the men and basically had the man's head in its mouth. The other guy ran away. The cougar let go of the man's head, chased down the guy running away, and ended up killing him. The guy whose head was in a cougar's mouth survived, and the guy that ran away got killed. So that, if that doesn't illustrate that chase instinct, I don't know what does. Like it's, it's one of those very sad stories, but it's a very good example of not running away. Stay in closed areas. They're closed for a reason. If you say 
keep the wall place safe. Maybe it's to let them reproduce. Maybe it's during mating season. Maybe it's to let them raise their young. Maybe they need to eat. So if it's closed, stay out of there. And if there's a warning here, you're allowed to go in there. But know that there's probably a bear or a cougar or whatever the warning is for. And do those other things extra well. Make that extra noise. Have your bear spray ready. Be in a group. Keep your dogs on a leash. Uh, so you can go in warning areas, but just if you're going to go in, do all those other things really well to, to try and minimize that risk of an encounter. Stay on designated trail. It's better for the environment. You don't wreck any road and make all your own trails. Um, you know, stay there. It's good for the for the landscape, and also we're more predictable for wildlife. If we are on every trail all over the place at any time of day, day or night, the wildlife are going to be, where do I go? I have nowhere to go, and they might leave this area or the area you're hiking. And so, if we can stay on designated trails, we're also more predictable for wildlife. They'll know where we are and where we aren't, and they can try and avoid us. And, and part of that is that giving wildlife space. You know, we never approach them for any reason, especially not to take a picture or a selfie. We never feed them, whether it's a little squirrel or a big bear. They act the same way. Once they get a taste for human food, they're going to look at us as a food source and try and get food from us. I've had squirrels jump on my lap at Lake Agnes Tea House, like almost attacked by squirrels. Can you imagine if that was a group of bears that are jumping literally on your lap trying to get food from you? And, and, and you know, it's not it's not funny. And those squirrels, they can bite you. So never feed any dog. Now here's an example of the scat. So this is bear scat, you know, when it's outside of berry season, it's often black or brown, lots of seeds. It's, it's bigger than a pile of dog scat. But then in the summer, during uh, the, the summer months when they're eating up to 200,000 berries, it can look like strawberry jam. It can be very liquidy, almost can look like blood in some instances. Uh, but there'll be lots of little seeds. I bet if we ate 200,000 berries in a day, our scab would probably look similar to that too. And like I said before, we can do all those things right. We can do all those avoiding things, but still run into a bear, a cougar, a wolf, and elk. You know, wrong place at the wrong time, you never know. So I want to teach you three simple words to remember how to handle those encounters. Does anybody remember what words were you taught when you were younger? If you were caught on fire, what do you do? Stop, stop, drop, and roll. Exactly. So very similar to that. So the words I'm going to describe are stop, talk, and walk. So that first one, stop. Let's say we're all on a, a hike together. We come around the corner, and ten meters away, there's a bear right on our trail. That first thing we do is we stop. We do not run. We never run away from wildlife. We gather a group together, and I'd be getting my bear spray. Ten meters away, I'd be getting it out and having it ready just in case. Don't worry, this is inert bear spray. It's not the real things. Don't be worried if I'm getting it sort of in your direction. But I get that bear spray out and have it ready to go. There's that stop. That second word, talk. We talk to the animal in a calm voice. Doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what you say. Just be calm. And if you can be calm, chances are the wildlife, the animal will be calm as well. And it really does work. And I've got a great video to illustrate that kind of staying calm. And maybe talk to the group and remind them what to do. Say, okay, guys, no, don't run away. We're going to back away slowly and leave the area. So there's that talk. The third word, walk. Once again, we don't run. We just back away slowly, leaving the area. Remember telling the group, we don't want to turn our backs and just go away and think, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all done. Always just back away slowly and leave the area. Now, you don't have to back away slowly like this for two kilometers. You know, I mean, I'd say once you're 100 meters away or something and look safe, and I would turn around and keep walking, and maybe, you know, look over your shoulder once in a while and just see if there's anything coming up behind you. At any point during that stop, talk, and walk, if the bear, cougar, elk, whatever, charges at you, or you feel like your life's in danger, or you feel threatened, pull out your bear spray and use it. That's what you have it for. Give it a good one to two seconds spray in the face. Got to be in the face. Spraying a bear in the bum does nothing. There's a thick fur. And get in that in that face. And then leave that area. You don't run away. You don't like high five all your friends. Like, yeah, I just spray the bear and turn your back and leave. Because what happens if you spray a two-year-old grizzly cub or a yearling and you're like all proud because you just got your whole can of bear spray? And then all of a sudden, an angry mother bear comes running out of the woods, and you got an empty can of bear spray, and you're all proud of yourself. And now you're like, uh oh, what do I do now? So use enough as needed, but don't be wasteful with it. And some people might say, oh, using that bear spray, isn't that mean to the bear? What if the bear was just block charging? 
What if it wasn't trying to attack you? The thing with bear spirits, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why that animal is charging at you. By using the bear spray, you're probably actually going to help save that animal's life. Because typically, if bears or other animals get in close contact with people, it's the wildlife that pays the price. They're the ones that typically will get trapped and relocated or translocated or destroyed. Relocation, translocation is about 30% success. Better than zero, but still not great. So you just want to, um, you know, try, you want to have animals on the landscape. So by teaching them that lesson, by, by spraying them, you're teaching them, it's not okay to approach people, stay away from people. Because if you do, you're probably going to end up getting hurt or killed. So um, it actually teaches them a good lesson. It's a, a positive lesson with a negative stimulus. Parents, have you ever heard of those in, in your parenting techniques? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so really, although it seems mean, it's not lethal, the, the effects go away, but it does work. There's bears that have been sprayed several times, you know, either through aversive conditioning or other places. And some of them have heard that bell girl sound, as soon as you hear that, or this, the sound of that clip, and they're already running away because they know what comes next. And it seriously does work. So I just wanted to show this little video, and this was taken about, I think about three years ago, and I just two weeks ago met one of the three uh, individuals in this group. It was on Eeyore, and it's just a really good illustration of that stop, talk, and walk, and how you can stay calm in an encounter with a very big grizzly bear in this case. Stay there, Barry. Don't follow us. Don't come towards us. I don't want to use my bear spray. <laughs> That's a good boy. good boy. That's a good boy. Crap, he's huge. That's good. Okay, come forward. Come We're forward. Not gonna no, come forward. That's it. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. Keep going. <clears throat> That's a good boy. Look at you go. Crap, he's huge. <laughs> See, I just, I just love showing that video because it just, it's just a perfect example of a very well handled encounter. They were, they were calm. They did all those things. They talked to each other. They talked to the animal. They had bear spread out. They just happened to be in the way. The bear just wanted to go down the trail. They were on the trail it found another way around let's say there was no other way around and the bear stayed on the trail then it was safe to do so those people could just move to the side with their bear spray ready and then if the bear keeps going they just went in the way if the bear turns to follow them maybe there's something else going on and i put bear spray out just in case but a just really well handled encounter it is possible to stay calm and not run away when you're running to animals like big blue bears like that so it's just a great video i love showing it Elk. So obviously, I talk a lot about bears, but elk are definitely in the Bow Valley by far more dangerous than than bears and any other animal. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's an article that came out a few months ago, and in within Alberta, I think over two thirds of all wildlife attacks were by elk. Attacks on humans were by elk, and I don't didn't see the statistics, but I'm sure the Bow Valley, you know, had more bad was the bulk of those encounters or attacks, uh, just also sheer numbers with visitors and people here in the valley and lots of elk. And around Canada, a lot of elk, as I call them, urban elk that live and you know do everything within the town boundary. So key thing with elk, you know, we never want to sneak past them. We are right just at the beginning of elk calving season right now, which in my opinion is the most dangerous time of the year around here in the Bull Valley. We're all sharing the valley bottoms. Uh, all the people are on the, in the valley bottoms on the trails. So there's still snow up high. The bears are in the valley bottoms looking for food. The elk are in the valley bottoms eating food. All the other animals, cougars are in the valley bottoms looking for their food, which are deer. And the elk are going to have their calves along the river trails and grassy wooded areas, often near playgrounds or soccer fields or parks because there's a good food source for them. And that draws predators in because they you know cougars, wolves, pets, they want to eat those baby elk. So we're all in this finite space together. So in my opinion, that's why it's the highest likelihood in the spring of running into wildlife. 
And those females all can be super aggressive. You can be minding your own business, not even knowing that they're there or there's a cop in the bushes. And if you just get too close, you could get charged by a female. I've talked to numerous people, some friends of mine in the last two years that have been charged by female health. And, um, and I've heard lots of stories of people successfully using bear spray to protect themselves. You know, some people on the edge of the river and it's either use my bear spray or fall in backwards in the river because this mother elk was not letting her pass. Every time she tried to go past her, the elk was moving. So, you know, bear spray, even though it's called bear spray, it's been shown to be effective on cougars, wolves, cows, elk, aggressive dogs. So if you need to use it, use it. Uh, the other time of year in the fall during the rut is another time when elk um, are more aggressive. In this case, it's the male elk. If you're not a female elk, you're a threat. Whether you're on a bike, in a car, they've been known to charge at truck pickup trucks and looks like there's big bullet holes, but it's the antler holes going through them. So you just don't want to get in their way. And the, the best thing you do is just give them space. Don't sneak past them, especially along, along the river trails. I see people sneaking past all the time. If you do get in a situation and you don't have bear spray, uh, ideally, maybe you can hide behind a solid structure like a tree, like in this picture, or a picnic table, playground, toilets, whatever. Car, um, but if you don't have bear spray and you don't have anything to hide it behind, and you're in the, in the middle of the field, that's where it can get tricky because you don't want to run away because they might chase you as well. I know they're not a predator, but um, you know, by you running away, they often might think that you did something, <laughs> or like they need to, they just feel the need to chase you. So in that situation, you might have to just make yourself big, loud, and, and yell and, and intimidate that animal because you definitely don't want to lay on the ground or play dead or anything because they can be over a thousand pounds. They got sharp hooves. So once again, like being aware of your surroundings and taking care of that bear spray, just in case you never know. It'd be a scary thing being in a field with, let's let's say in October with a whole bunch of male elk and female elk and you had nowhere to stand behind or hide and you know they're actually aggressive toward you. So definitely stay away from elk. This is an example on the Grimmel channels of people just going too close to elk. That's not three bus lengths or 30 meters. That's, uh, that's probably you know, maybe three or four meters. That's not enough space. Uh, and this, I just wanted to show this because I'll be willing to bet that within the next week or two, you'll be seeing sound, signs like this around Canmore because it is elk having season. Every year, places like the Boardwalk over by Spring Creek, they, they have a warning sign there because there's one elk that love, loves having their calves there. But along the river trails, we'll see them a lot and definitely in certain neighborhoods around Canmore. So please be aware of those warnings and take them seriously. Uh, and, and really consider carrying your bear spray, even when you're going for walks around town and whatever trails and that sort of thing. You never know when you might run in. And I've had lots of people um, that after the fact they admit, they say, Nick, you know what? I'm glad you told me that because I, I never used to carry bear spray when I went to go pick the garbage or pick the dog or this or that. And they're like, I actually got charged by a mother elk and it was very scary and it wasn't fun. And so now I care about bear spray. Everybody. I'm not just saying it to be cool, it actually does work. It's a good thing to have. Cougars, the other one I want to mention, especially with families, whenever I do presentations, cougars are always the animal that people are most afraid of. But it's because they're sneaky, they're stealthy, they're ambush predators. But in, in all of Canada, there's only been seven people killed by a cougar in 100 years. Five of them were kids, one was a mother protecting her child, and another one was actually a 30 year old husband this year in Banff, uh, Frost. So typically, you don't often hear about stories of cougars attacking adults. Most of the stories involve a dog, a dog off leash in particular, and or children, and especially you know children running in erratic movements. Like children run all over the place. Their, their movements are erratic, and so it can catch the attention of cougars. And the same goes with dogs off leash and running in all sorts of patterns. So uh, just be aware of that. You know, keep those pets on a leash, kids close by. And just avoid hiking, once again, same as you said, avoid hiking at night or dawn or dusk. That's when the wall like often are most active and it's nice for us to give, give them some space and give them a chance. Bear spray, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about it, but uh, we'll be able to, uh, if anyone that wants to, we'll be doing some bear spray training outside after. So I'll talk a little more then. But for those that don't know how to use bear spray or how to carry it, on our website, wallsport.ca slash bear spray, there's a bear spray video. It's subtitled in English plus nine other languages. You can see them here on the bottom. You just scroll down and watch the video with subtitles in those languages and a great, you know, five minute video on how to use bear spray. Really quickly, 
you can spend in the whole valley, you can buy it at many outdoor stores, sports stores. Uh, you can even rent them at places like Trail Sports at the Nordic Center in Europe uh, if you don't want to buy a can. You got to sign a waiver, you got to be over 18. One thing I will say for those parents here, um, and I do see it around the whole valley a lot, which is great, is children younger than 18 whose parents deem them responsible enough to carry bear spray if they go hiking or biking or running without adults, you know, if they go up with their friends. And I think that's great. The only thing I would just tell parents is really have that talk with your children. It's it's a privilege, not a right. And it should be used only for the right reasons and not to goof off. And uh, there's enough things in the news about people using bear spray to rob stores and all that stuff. We don't want that happening here with, with youth because then they're just going to make it illegal. And, and I don't think that's good because, I mean, you have... Two sons, uh, I'm sure you did the same thing, you know, make sure they're responsible. But I, I would want my kids, you know, when they're 14 years old and going out without me, I would want them to carry bear spray as well. Just really quickly, bear spray. I remember I said, you don't spray it on yourself. It's not like bug spray. You got to spray in your animal's face. It's temp the effects are temporary. The bear will have trouble seeing, trouble breathing, maybe coughing, maybe gagging. If we get it on ourselves and have that burning sensation, it's not nice. Has anyone ever had bear spray on themselves? It's not that pleasant, but it doesn't last forever. It goes away. A really good tip to have in your backpack or your first aid kit is that Johnson Johnson baby shampoo. Because um, you never want to rub, if you get bear spray on yourself, you never want to rub because it's oily. But that baby shampoo is designed not to irritate the eyes, hence it's used on babies. Um, if you rinse out your eyes with that and water, it works really well if you get it in your eyes or if your kids get it in their eyes. Uh, and that's that's the, and otherwise if you're out hiking or camping and you get it on yourself and there's a creek or a lake, I would dunk my head in or dunk my arm or whatever I sprayed on in the water. Cool, clean water is a good way to get it off. Where to carry it? Always on your person. I love these scat belts that you can wear. This one's made by Kodiak. Um, you can have them on the front, side, back, whatever you want. But otherwise, you can also have hip holsters, chest holsters. Whatever you can to have it easily accessible. Do not carry it in your backpack. You will not have enough time to get it out. Remember, it does expire. It's only good for two to three years. Uh, it's not recommended to use expired bear spray. So really double check to see the expiration date. And this picture was actually taken about five years ago. Um, it was at Quarry Lake, Canada Day long weekend. It was well over 30 degrees. Bear spray was left in the car and it exploded. It's not a pleasant thing to have happen. So please, if you're going, uh, if it's really hot somewhere, don't leave bear spray in your car on hot day. I just want to met, finish off with a few resources for you. Where do you find information? Just like Linda was showing uh, some websites and her fabulous books and information, places to find that. We want it to be easily accessible. So every Thursday night, I send out a weekly bear report with warnings, closures, what's going on with wildlife around here, wildlife in the news, events coming up, you know, different talks. You can subscribe to the website. I also post on Facebook. That, that's one thing we send out. We have a warnings and closure page uh, for the Bull Valley and Cape Country, as well as Banff. Look to see where warnings and closures are before leaving the house. Be prepared. Have a backup plan just in case. Nature for newcomers. For those newcomers, uh, we have wildlife safety information in, in these languages that are here. These nine, of course, English. Uh, so if there's a language barrier, we have people coming from other countries. You can direct them there. Uh, I wanted to mention also Friends of Kananaskis Country. I did some great work with Kananaskis Public Safety and the Mountain Rescue just to, to, to get some of this safety information, a lot of the same stuff that Linda was talking about. Um, on their website at kananaskis.org, you know, everything from knowing before you go, what to carry, what to wear, what to do in emergency, all those things, and doing that research before you leave the house. That's key. So that's another good place to get some information. And just like Linda, I always, I'm going to finish off with some important phone numbers that people should have in their phones. That first one is Banff Dispatch. If you need to report a bear, a cougar, wolf, or aggressive wildlife, call that Banff Dispatch number there. The top, and in Bow Valley and Kananaskis Country, you want to call Kananaskis Emergency Services, KES 4351-7755. People should all have those in their phones. Um, if you don't have your phone with you, Lucky for you, it's not only on our brochure, but I got a few stickers for those with our website and that phone number to call as well. So help yourself with a sticker afterwards. But it's really important to know those know those phone numbers. And 
Absolutely. Like if you see a deer on the side of the road, you don't need to report that. But if there's a deer that's very aggressive, that's attacking people or an elk, that certainly should be reported. Absolutely. And I'll just finish off with my contact information as well. And um, wanted to open up to any questions. And uh, for those that are able to stay, I'll be talking more about bear spray outside. We'll actually get the chance to try the inner bear spray. But are, are there any questions uh, from anybody in the room from anything that I covered and that I maybe did cover? Yeah. I have a few. Yes. So um, I have a dog. Yes. And I have to walk him at night, like 10 or 11 o'clock. And we live up uh, three sisters. So there's elk in the evenings all the time that are on the different people's lawns. And they said there was cougars just down the valley before Denton's flat. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there must be bear around. Uh, anything for me, I try not to go very far at night when I walk the dog. I always have the headlamp, have my bear spray. Um, but um, I have to go a little way around him at the little park yet, but we don't go anywhere else because I'm quite nervous to walk him. There's not usually people out. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're, you know, and he's it's, a medium sized guy. Yeah, the key thing there, keep your dog on a leash. I mean, ideally, if you can stay in lit areas, that's going to be a little bit safer for you. Okay. But yeah, where you live, yes, there was a, 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 a cougar warning there a couple of weeks yes. ago. There's always elk and bears in that area. So you just oh. have to live in an area where there's lots of wildlife. And that's a risk you have to be willing to take uh, if you're going to be going out at night. Yes. Uh, definitely make noise. You don't want to be walking around really quietly through all those. But so you can't know you the so. Yak and wait at the dog. Yeah, like okay. just make noise. Just don't be going around quiet in the dark. That's okay. what I would say. If you can stay in more illuminated places, have your flashlight on or a headlamp, great. Uh, but just understand there is that risk. You are going out at night. You're backing up right by where the wildlife corridors are. There's golf courses there. Yes. Like, there are lots of animals there. So I, I tried to take a flashlight too to see if I can see in the eye. You know, and I checked if there's um, ways the houses are kind of hanging all over. So there's, there's the runways underneath. And I always check those areas before we go out of kind of our little fits place. Um, so if if I was doing that night um, and I see something and we're out like a house or two, we don't go very far, um, and the dog starts barking, what do I do? As I can hold him and I can back up, but he's probably going to be barking yeah. and trying to. And that's okay. And just don't let the dog pull you towards no, no, where it wants to go. Just but be I can't stop the barking. No, I mean, there's nothing, uh, unless you muzzle your dog, you can't stop that barking. And they're going to bark. There's going to be smells and all different yeah. sounds. And so just, if, as long as you be neutral, I would just back away and leave that area. Yeah. Just leave the area. Don't, if, if, don't go in the direction that that dog is barking. No, 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 no. Yeah. But it's even with him barking, back away is that. Yeah, thing. absolutely. And no one really knows how your animal is going to react. But typically, there's going to be barking. And if they're not on a leash, there's going to be chasing. Oh, yeah, no, he's on a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's on actually a jacket, yeah. so I've got better control of it yeah. rather than just the collar. So with the elk, they're coming and going by the place all the time, and he, uh, they come in the dust quite a bit of time. Um, again, with the dog, like when an elk charges you, how is that different than a bear charging? Because I imagine a bear charging me is going to come and try to bite me or something. But when an elk comes at me, what what does that mean? It could look very similar. Like, I've personally never been charged by either, but uh, but typically it's going to be an animal running towards you, and uh, they're both both types of animals are all very quick. Yeah. And the best thing I can say is you know be able to pull your bear spray out quickly. And that's why I recommend people having that. Yeah, I usually have it in, in under in under three seconds ideally, and, and be able to use that. But an elk. Can run very quickly, just and are they there. to headbutt you? Is that what they're trying? Not necessarily. A male elk potentially because they've got their antlers, yeah, and then that's what they use their antlers for to fight each other during the mating season and for protection against other animals. But um, a female might be running towards you, and when they get to you, they might could potentially jump up uh -huh. towards you with their hooves. Okay, they're very strong and they've got sharp hooves. Dogs that have been known to be 
killed by the hooves, sliced open by the hooves. Um, you know, so typically I'd say a male would likely have antlers forward and charging at you okay. and or kind of running over you or using their, their paws, which of the front legs, which a female probably would do as well, kind of trap a little bit. Okay. But, uh, yeah. I know, I've never been in it myself, but from the, the friend that I had that had been charged, it was just kind of the animal running towards them that didn't actually make contact, but was just kind of pinned them against the fence. Yeah. Right and I suppose the best I could do is just kind of lean against the house and kind of go along the wall, maybe, to get that in. You could try that or, or try and position yourself behind something solid. Yeah. Um, they're not very good. They're good at running fast. They're not good at doing zigzags and going around corners quickly. So if you no, were to try and get away, don't run in a straight line. Like if you were to try to leave the area, you know, try and <laughs> do a zigzag pattern or or yeah, hide behind something because they can't get around the corner just, just quickly. It's true. There's cars behind Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, behind a car. Okay. No, that's helpful because I am very nervous, but I have to take it. I mean, I yeah. can't get around that either. Uh, but we don't. Well, nice. you know, well I've been in this question, but I, I've, um, I witnessed an elk go after somebody in yes. the Um, It was a, a young mother, a mother with her young son, actually, and they were getting closer and closer to the baby taking a picture. And the mom, you could tell the mother elk was getting really agitated. And she was kind of stepping forward, stepping forward. And then finally, um, you ever see a horse's head when they nod like that? And yeah. then he just caught, then the elk just caught and like miss just inches of missing the little guy. So that's how this attack was happening. Like the elk gave lots of warning. The mom gave lots of warning, the head nodding and the kind of like the pawing on the ground. And then finally she just went on her back legs and just came down and boom. And just like if this little guy was any closer, he would that would have been it. So that brings me to another question. Um, is my grandson lives like a street over, and uh, sometimes yeah. he'll be out walking around uh, after dinner with his mom and dad or myself, and the elk are coming because we're in a quarter. So mm -hmm. the elk are coming across, and you say, Don't go beside them, but you know, we're stepping out of our house and they're there, right? And maybe we haven't seen each other or whatever. Um, like, are we better to go in while the elk are crossing? Is it like is the grandson's too? And yes, this brings me uh, without getting into too much thing about the whole urban elk issue in my opinion, which is I my know opinion, it's a huge issue. issue but some I'm people really like having elk in town, but it causes all sorts of problems, and in the long run, it's not going to be good for the elk no. to be in town. No. Um, but it's actually a learned behavior. These elk have learned. If I can act, if I can address it to these people, they're going to step away. They're going to put this nice yellow tape around my perfect spot that I want to hang out in, and no one's going to bother me. And they're just going to do that's a learned behavior. And they realize well, I can do this, and I get peace and quiet. And I'm kind of in town. There's no predators because they're outside of town. This is oh, amazing. Okay. But they they they've learned this. This is not just natural behavior from elk. Uh, and so, you know, back in the day, if an elk set foot in Canmore or in other towns, they'd get shot or eaten. And right. those elk that weren't smart and didn't realize that, they died. The ones that were smart and realized that they stayed in a town and they reproduced and that that kind of instinct or whatever of not living in town kind of got passed on. Uh, but now over the years, elk have figured out that it's safest in town. Yes, because we're right on the edge of the exactly. Yeah. And so that's coming to the point now exactly where Elk who might be in your front yard, yeah. and you can't even leave the house, and you're already scared to leave the house, right? And that's that's where that where it's a bit tricky with the, that whole urban elk thing. So I mean, I would recommend, uh, you know, for you right now, and that's in that case, just just give them their space. You know, I don't necessarily want people all running outside of their house and start spraying every and every animal they see. No, but, no. But yeah, definitely, you know, give them, give them that space. But it's tricky if they're in your front or backyard. They that's also, why it's not good to have them in there. Yeah. You know? There's nothing wrong with, with yelling, shouting, trying to get them out of your backyard, yeah. make it unpleasant for them, yeah. um, and hopefully they'll all come back home. Yeah. But it's hard in the area where you live. So many, there's so much wildlife. So much. Yeah. Okay. Are there any that questions? Helpful. Are there any questions from anyone online? Uh, not of them. <laughs> but yeah, if um, people do have more questions, we can uh, yeah. come and chat to Nick and yeah. uh, Linda afterwards.
Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say um, thanks very much, Linda, for coming um, it's really great to have you here and thank you, Nick, as well. Um, and then, uh, Nick, do you want to explain briefly what's happening here? Yeah, so for those that would like to, um, give you guys an opportunity to try some bear spray outside. And this is inert bear spray. And I've got a little black bear in the back there that um, that we'll, we'll use as our target. And um, for the, anyone that maybe has any little ones, we've also, if you want to try, we've got a baby carrier and a baby. So you can actually try and use your bear spray while you've got a baby on you. I definitely recommend these kind of belts. Um, I, I have two kids, a six and a seven year old, and I've always, always had this belt on and I've always on my back, on my right, whether I have it in a child carrier or I'm camping or I'm mountain biking, whatever, hiking, it's always here. And I've always practiced pulling it out with that, all that different equipment, no matter what I'm doing, to get that muscle memory, because you might have to pull it out in under three seconds. So um, being prepared and planning ahead and practicing is key. And you know, Linda mentioned as well, you know, you just you just gotta get practice and just be prepared. And this is all stuff you can do at home. You don't have to do this on the trail. It's all being prepared. So um, yeah, you don't have to join me outside, but for those that want to try it that have never tried it, this is. This inner bear spray, it's exactly the same can mechanism, everything as the as real bear spray. It just doesn't have the pepper ingredient. So if you get it on yourself, it's okay. That's what we practice with. But other than that, getting the clip off, everything else is the same. So it's the perfect way to, to try that and, and see how it works. Uh does there I guess it's pretty warm outside still. I guess maybe I'll maybe I'll do the, the little bit of the talking here and then we can go outside to the actual spray because it might be hotter there. Well, it's pretty warm out unless someone wants to go out into the heat. But, but uh, in short, I really touched on a few of the key things with the bear spray. But um, remember, we don't spray it on ourselves. We spray it on the animal. We want to remember that the, the actual bear spray has pepper in it. It's got a scent. So once you spray it, it might actually attract wildlife. It, it's considered an attractant. So never spray it just for finding your campground or to test it. You want to make sure um, if you want to test it, do it far away from people or campgrounds or anything like that. It's not lethal, I meant that as well. It gets you out of a dangerous situation, but it doesn't kill the animal, which is much better. Traditionally, people use guns and then they would kill the animal. But if we're out hiking, biking, enjoying the trails, first thing, I don't think it's fair that an animal gets killed uh, just for you, just for your safety's sake. So having bear spray, it's it's far more effective and it doesn't kill the animal. So it's very good to have. I already mentioned it's got to be carried on your person, hip holster, belt, chest holster, not on your backpack. Uh, so it's about $50 and there's an expiry date, remember, two, three years. And in terms of um, the, the two main numbers you need to know, I already told you one of them, four or five meters is the average range that it sprays, about the length of a car, which is about from me to you. Some cans like mine say nine meters. I think on a no wind or downwind situation, that's probably realistic. I don't know if I would trust the nine meters. And then the other number is six to eight seconds. The average can has six to eight seconds in it. Once it's empty, it's empty. So you want to spray enough to get in the bear's face. That's why I recommend a good one to two second. But don't just waste it because like I said, there might be more bears in the area. Once it's empty, it's empty. Now, some people often ask, uh, what if I use it for one second? but then don't need it for another year or two, should I buy a new one? That's really up to you. Typically, if you know for sure that you only used one second, it's pretty safe to assume that, you know, you've got at least four or five seconds remaining in the can. But if you spray, if you're actually spraying it at a bear, adrenaline is running, time, time may not go as you see in your head or remembered in your head. So you might not be sure exactly how much you use. So. When in doubt, I would say just get another get another can uh, just to be safe. And over time, once you've sprayed it, it might leak out a little bit. So that's why if you sprayed it once, if you have it on the shelf for two or three years, um, I don't know if I would trust it um, completely. So then I would just buy a new can. So four to five meters, six to eight seconds are the two main numbers you need to know. And when you're spraying a bear, today it's gonna be unrealistic because I don't have a moving bear with me. The bear is stationary, so it's not as realistic. In real life, if you're using bear spray, it'll be because a bear or animal is running towards you. 
Otherwise, why are you using your bear spray? It's only to save your life if a bear or animal is running towards you. So if you were the bear, sorry, I'm not picking on you, but you're just the perfect distance away. <laughs> if you were the bear charging at me, if I sprayed it at your face, it would go over your head because as it got to you, you actually would be here because you're running towards me. So I would rather spray where your head's going to be. So if you were the bear, I'd be spraying right down towards here because by the time the spray gets there, that's when you're there and your face would go into that cloud. Does that make sense? So makes sense. So when in doubt, it's better to spray low than high. And when you're spraying, you don't have to necessarily be all calm and like, it's okay, bear, have a nice day. If you're at the point where you're spraying the bear spray, that's you want to make it as unpleasant as possible. So get out of here. Ah! Whatever, whatever negative, the negative stimulus, you want to add, you know, loud noise, whatever, make it unpleasant for them uh, at that point. At that point, you don't have to be like, it's okay, nice bear here. I'm going to spray you now. Shh. <laughs> like just yell, scream, whatever you need to do to make it unpleasant. Uh, and then once you've sprayed that bear, once again, don't turn around and run. You want to back away slowly and leave that area. And in terms of, I see a lot of people, you know, they pull out and use, they use one hand to cool, quick drop. Now, this is pressurized. Almost everyone I see using one hand sprays too high. Because when you push it, it goes because it's pressurized. So use those two hands. So the best thing I can, the best technique I can say is once you pull it out, get that finger through the loop, other fingers behind. I see this a lot. And then people spray their own fingers and then it ricochets in their eyes. So fingers at the back and uh, push down that lever and that activates the spray a good one or two seconds. And then into the bare space and then you but that second hand just helps steady. And if you're already using it, you probably got adrenaline going and you're nervous, whatever, and you just want to just get to steady it with that other hand. Are there any questions on, on that? The, the quick and dirty on how to use your bear spray. And it's the exact same with real bear spray. The only difference is this doesn't have the pepper and it's white. That has the pepper in it and it's yellow, orange, or brown in color. It's a little bit more powerful, the kick on a, on a real can than this, but it's very, very similar. And once again, there's that video on our website at wallsmart.ca if anyone wants to watch uh, more on that. So if anyone that wants to come try it, come on out. Uh, is anyone going to want to try the baby carrier? Or... I'll pass that. Yeah, you pass that stage? <laughs>